I was. <coughs> All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the C Show. My name is Chris. I'm here with Wolf today, and I understand you are a romance author, correct? Yes, that is correct, sir. So what exactly is a romance author? I mean, what, what does that entail? I mean, in a sense, it's, it's writing love stories. One way or another, you're writing a love story between a man and a woman, a man and a man, or a woman and a man, or whatever it may be, really. All in all, it's just love and, you know, passion. Literally. Are, are there different also. types of I guess, genres of... Or... You know, because I heard that like Hemingway was a uh, wrote love stories. Is there different love, different versions, or I guess what I'm trying to ask? I mean, there are. There's a uh, young adult romance. There's new adult romance. There's a uh, fictional romance. There's fantasy romance, erotic romance. You get so, the gist. Okay, so um. Fantasy romance. What would what exactly would that be? Fantasy romance is kind of like the novels you read, uh, Harry Potter and the, and the lot. Those are fantasy novels, okay. but you uh, add a twist of you know you add a twist of uh, romance into it. Like uh, fuck. Uh, let's say there's a good character, a sexy kind of beastly male character that every woman loves. You know that. Sexy, big, tall guy, abs, uh, lo looks like a villain. Everyone loves him. Yeah. Falls in love with the uh, pure woman or pure innocent girl, yada, yada. Those are usually those, you know, your romance novels in fantasy. Pure princess falls in love with some badass villain guy. Okay. That's it. Um, you said, uh, you said erotica. Does that have more sex involved in it, erotica, or... Uh, or is it more is it more of a sexual type book I guess I'm asking well I would say erotica is a middle ground you can have sex in every scene if you want or in every mm -hmm. chapter rather or you can have this sort of intimacy where you know you're with your partner and you're the gentle caresses on your touch on your skin or a kiss or th those small intimate moments of humanity where you just feel each other there physically um, emotionally that the, the can also tell it. Hmm? So it would be like a uh, like uh, based on like a movie like the bridges of madison county sort of yeah yeah um i've not watched too many romance movies in my life but i've watched a few i did i remember watched that when uh when I was a kid. So what got you inspired to write romance novels? Or are you just uh, that? Um, hmm. That's a good question. Person? I mean, you know, because you know, most guys are, uh, they're going to, you know, read about killing and destruction and fighting and blowing stuff up and, <laughs> you know, a bunch of death. and destruction. That's where the good stuff's at, man. So, so what, what, brought you there i mean i mean when i was give or take i'd say 10 years old 11 somewhere in that scale i read fitzgerald's book uh f scott fitzgerald's tender is the night the okay. you know literary, literary classic besides uh the great gatsby and the lad and I fell in love with that gentle prose where you feel kind of like when you're reading it, you're not feeling attacked. You're not feeling like you have to rush somewhere or you're thinking of a bad situation. You're just feeling calm. You're feeling gentle. You're feeling at home. And I wanted to give that feeling out to everyone else by writing, by like being, hey, you can, with this book, you can take a break. You can just breathe, enjoy, relax. Things are okay. And that's eventually where it started. Okay, so I, I've never actually written one. Like I, I do a little writing myself. It's just all hobby, though. But everyone's like, when I finish one, leading into a chat room, like <laughs> things are like, why did you stop there? You just left us hanging. It, it you know, the suspense. Is there suspense in romance novels, or does it each chapter just kind of close out? 
there is a lot of suspense in romance chapters and novels too. Okay. There's there's always some suspense. There's either some conflict between you and the well between the main character and antagonists. There's or some sort of conflict between the lovers. There's always gonna be something that's happening. Like um, you know, let's let's use Fifty Shades of Grey for an example. Big billionaire falls in love with a normal woman. Normal woman goes into the situation with this billionaire. They end up having to fight off secret agents, uh, yada yada, because she gets into danger due to a jealous ex and so forth. You know, there's there's always going to be some sort of situation stopping the couple from the end goal being together. So you're always going to feel like you want things to happen, you want them to get together, but there's going to be constant things. Getting in the way. Yeah. That's the suspense novels, like suspense romance, or you have the gentle romance where it's just a slow and steady slide into the ending where you they are finally in love and together. You know. So, is there ever any romance novels that you know went along the lines of the type of relationships I've been in, where the end almost comes down to a violent murder? Uh, no, it it's more of a really um, <laughs> not mine and always, uh, you know, when I mean, they say bad romance, like, no, so, you know, is it going to end with, you know, my trial and their funeral or, you know, one way or the other? So, so I've, I've just wondered if they ever had that type of um, element into a um, romance novel that uh, in, ended with a fatal attraction type thing. There's been quite a few famous novels that actually have. There's a, a good couple of spy novels and um, other novels where the main character either dies or there's, you know, you end up falling in love with a spy and that ends up being your death. It, it ends up being a fatal attraction. Or you sacrifice yourself for your partner or, you know, all these situations where something bad happens to the character. Um, are all of these, or, well, I'm sure. Or, mm. but how many of them are, or percentage wise, would you say are, are affairs? Um, or maybe mm. there's a third involved? Um, I mean, you I know, you have all kind of different romance a, novels. There's a lot of romance novels that have affairs. I won't lie mm. on that. There's a lot. There's a. God, there's the apple tree yard that I read just a few months back, which was a married woman writing on her computer about a man she met in a gallery uh, down in somewhere in the UK, I believe. I don't remember the exact area. And she had sex with him in the underground, and she kept writing that onto her computer and that, and eventually that story ends up in her going to court, you know, having to face the consequences of her being a... Uh, lover against someone else who has a lot of secrets but you know th that's just one example of many many books that has uh, unfaithfulness cheating affairs uh what well, okay for the next question Do, is, are there romance novels where um you have uh what i'm saying were they polyamorous relationships we have more than two people involved there are, yeah. There, there's plenty of those too. Um, that's a market in of itself, actually. That's a, that's a whole market. Because <laughs> I've People. seen that more. I don't know if it's changing of the times or what, because I, I see that more and more and more today. Of yeah, it's uh, mm -hmm. it's become an open thing in society as of late. You know, being um, instead of uh, mono, you become polyamorous with other people and. It's, in my eyes, this is specifically in my eyes only, I believe polyamorous relationships will end in failure no matter what you do. You can go on <laughs> for years on years and you can love each other, you know, you can love as many women as you want, but at the ending, it will end in failure. At the um, least, this is what I believe. But it's uh, become an open market for books, for movies, for games, um, unique. Uh, so I didn't want to say I was I was uh, laughing at, at you. Um, uh, when what you said made me um, 
uh, laugh because I've noticed that um, it, it seems to be more prevalent among gay males than with um, and straight couples. And I laugh because I said um, I've never seen them. Um, uh, <laughs> I never my friend. Well, I was like, wait a minute. I said, he was giving me one of those. I said, dude, I've never seen anything work out between two gay males past one day. I said, now you're getting three of them involved in there. I said, this, this is going to end in a disaster. <laughs> and it usually uh, it usually does. <laughs> but I agree oh, with you on that um, a polyamorous relationship. I just don't see how uh, that would work in that. But I, I imagine it could be very interesting as far as the writing goes. Um, Oh, it definitely yeah. is. It is a very big oh, untapped market that a lot of people are still using for money because uh, a lot of women love those, you know, triangles, love triangles or foursomes or the, the lot of groups that people fall in love with, different characters, different scenarios, yada, yada. And it, it's very common with women too, not just men, um, polyamorous relationships. Very, very common, actually. Maybe I don't get that enough. Um, okay. Um, so this polyamorous, so this is a market that's just now starting to be tapped into, or this, or it's, it's got tapped into. Uh, uh, I would say it started a few years back. Uh, yeah. It wasn't as popular in two thousand and two thousand seven, two thousand eight. It wasn't as popular. Two thousand and thirteen to fifteen is when it began becoming more popular. Okay, when yeah. Society I began. It's yeah, like a. Okay. When society began opening up to BDSM, polyamorous relationships, love triangles, and the latter, this became a big, big market. BDSM became a market in of itself. Uh, poly relationships became a market in of itself. Love triangles for fantasy books, too. It's what a whole I'm... And I don't know if they, they, they just thought of this, if, if, or if they started writing or talked into it. Um, transsexuals so with a tra or transgender. I mean, is it, is, it started to, huh? those have become very popular as of late, as of the last, I believe, um, five years? Well, I was fixing to say so. It's thanks. It's, I mean, I don't know about the rest of the world, but here in the United States, it's became more to the forefront. Yeah. So, over the last five years, I would five or six years. So, I was wondering if that had. Something that it, it, anybody tapped into because that would be the first thing I'd be thinking. Bam, that's the market I would want to go after. Then, yeah, it's it's a very very um, popular market. Very very popular market. A, a lot of people are asking for gay erotica, gay romance, well, and much more, well, or transsexual well, romance, and more, much you know LGBTQ in general. I would have thought that. The transgender, I could definitely say. I would have thought that, that um, and tell me if I'm wrong, that the market for um, L LGBTQ or well for gays and lesbians would have, would have started really gaining steam in the 90s. And, it, and I'm thinking, it, and again, I'm it, it United did. States. It did. That's when the United States like, started, okay, don't ask, don't tell, and gays started getting, getting more rights. And that's when I would think it would have started people, but I'm sorry. Interrupt you. Go ahead. You tell me. No, 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 no. It's okay. It's okay. Um, it did begin getting big in the 90s, 1980, 1990s, you know, 1970, 1980. But it was still looked down upon because of the civil rights and the oh, course, yeah. rights to marriage and, you know, the whole, the whole shebang in the US and Europe and other countries, India to uh, China, Japan. A lot yeah, those countries. I mean, but I would think that, that you know Europe was so far ahead of the United States as far as allowing that. It, I mean, it wasn't it until two thousand two thousand and fourteen when the uh, United States Supreme Court. I mean, um, <laughs> look, at our, you know, our, uh, President Obama and President about now President Biden. They were against gay marriages up until the Supreme Court struck it down and and made it legal in 2008. You know that's how or 2014. That's how the country. You know the country was still against it. So um, I, I, I guess uh, what I was going back to is it was it seemed to be more been more accepting in Europe as far as the United States. I guess that would still be more taboo here. Um, you know, 
in Europe, it's um, it's rather normal. It, it's not new. It's still not widely accepted everywhere as of yet. There's still a few countries that are somewhat on the verge on these topics uh, in terms of you know, gay marriage. Hmm? Would that be more of the, Would that be more of your uh, Eastern European countries that used to be under Soviet domination? Uh, I wouldn't say that. It's a mix between all all of the countries, really. Um, and it's not just Russia, which has its you know controversy with gay gay marriage laws and, so, and such. But some countries in Europe accept them; other countries don't. And there's no specific area in which they don't, like Europe, Europe continent-wise. There's just Specific countries in Europe just either like it or don't, but they know they cannot. Um, they cannot deny them this right. They know this because of the European Union and the human rights and civil rights and you know the law. So they go along with it, but uh, some countries still do not openly accept it. They're still not fully open accepting to it. Uh, I've got a question for you, and it's something that um, is all alarming to me because I've seen doctors come out saying this is normal and um, trying try, trying to justify it. I actually watched one on a talk show the other night. Can you ever see or foresee it there being a market in it? In, I'm sorry, in this years down the road, of a pedophilia book, because I was watching this doctor the other night, and she was trying to say how this is normal and natural, and there's a movement here, and you know they've got this NAMLA stuff, and I'm, I'm just afraid that one day we're going to see that to where it, it, it's, it becomes accepted. You know, I hope not. I, I I truly truly hope not, because I find. Not too, uh, no, please don't think that I, don't take it that I was. No no ask. no, I'm not. I'm just it's saying, like disturbing. market wise, as as an asking for the question, market wise, I hope not. Considering, I am open to people dating young at the age of sixteen and dating someone older, like twenty three, twenty eight, etc. I'm I'm fine with that. If both are consensual and both are okay with it and understand each other and can be proper adults, because at 16, that's legal. You can have sex, you can go drink, you can do whatever. At 16, you're an adult. Fine, do whatever you want. But below that, below any, any legal age of which you would deem to be an adult and you would be deemed to be a fully fledged member of society, no. I I hope not to dare God that there will be such a market. There is. There is one. On the deep web as well as on the general internet, there is one. Mm -hmm. because, no, yeah, you know, yeah. There's been news on um, America, Asia about child abduction, child oh, pornography, yes. Yes. and a lot. And yeah. there's been some books that have stopped yeah. pedophilia, of which I am disgusted over. And I, I don't even know if you're aware of this, if you've, if you've been aware of this movement. This, I mean, NAMBLA has been around for a while, but here of late, when I've started seeing this, you know, these, it was small in the doctors, in the medical community, but these doctors are now, of movement, are trying to almost decriminalize this. I'm like, you know, well, this, this is not a route, you know, we, we've got to draw a line somewhere. Um, I, I, I just, I hope it doesn't. Um, I mean, I agree with you. I'm I'm not going to disagree with you on that. There's got to be a line somewhere because. So the next goes. I mean, uh, like since about sixteen, um, I just was that like here in the United States, um, the, the state that I live in, Alabama, uh, the legal age is sixteen. You know, they can go get yeah, married. Yeah, there's like some countries where the legal age is like thirteen and well, below. Like, the, why? Well, you can actually, why? get you can get you can get consent. For the age of 14 and the reason why is because it goes back to this goes back to um when a lot of times after the civil war especially um the population of uh, males they, they had a pension but when women when 
in the South was very poor, but when girls got to childbirthing age, the first thing they do is marry them off. And, and, you know, yeah. my grandmother, my grandmother get married, my grandfather, and you know, this is in the forties, almost a hundred years ago, she married him. He was 18 and she was 14. And that's, you know, so they got, they married him off. Um, my, my mother was 15 and my father was 21 and they signed the thing. So they get married. So it was a, um, you know, there was just, society now would look at it and, oh my god that's horrible some of them would but uh you know but that's just how it was they married them off then it, you know as soon as they got old enough to, to bear yeah. children it's just how it was you know uh, sorry it was pretty that. uh it, it was pretty normal for a good couple of years not only just in the u.s and in, in europe too you know you yeah. get a child you married them off uh either for money or aristocracy or god knows what reasons really but uh, that was normal it was really really normal yeah, I, I mean, I believe it's stopped being normal when we gave children proper human rights, when we gave them the rights to be children and the rights to have a proper childhood and go to school, enjoy friends, teaching, learning, etc. And that's good because we gave children a opportunity to study, to live life, to Right. Not have to have the grim life of hey, you're now a married woman at the age of fifteen, for God's sake. Yeah, they should be. Uh, that's just a child herself. Um, like I, I was. Um, what do you call it? I was engaged at a young age. Personally speaking, I was engaged. I wasn't married. No, I was engaged. And that person was around, I believe, two or one or two years younger than myself that is the only time i accepted being engaged to someone younger or at a young age because you were of equal age or at least you know within one or two years but after four or five years that's uh that's a big red red flag there that's a big no i think i mean, another question i got thinking of what says that i don't know uh, when i had that question pop up about that um market mm -hmm. For that, is there a genre, or I guess that's the right word, a market? Is it for uh, teenage love stories or for older people? You know, like sixties, seventies. Is there anything? There is. Like that? There's, there's both of those markets. There's the young adult romance, which is the teenage romance or coming of age. Even there's that too, and there's the uh, older times. Um, your older times is basically 60, 70, 80, etc. Mm -hmm. Love stories between the old people. Or um, sorry, go ahead. you could call it just classic romance, really. That, what, that's it. What about like, because uh, I mean, I've seen you know, all kind of movies like this. What about like, um, um, of course, obviously you wouldn't get into sex stuff, but uh, like uh, with. Um, uh, Oh, I can't remind myself of it. Uh, middle school kids, like 12, 13 year old kids, you know, the, uh, the movie like with my dog Skip and, you know, and my first kiss. Are, are, there, are there novels about that? Yeah, I mean, you, I, you can read those it, coming of age, you know. There's, there's, there's coming of age novels. They're uh, mm -hmm. stories where you just follow the young child growing up and and during their first. Uh, their first game, their first heartbreak, their first kiss, their first love. Yeah, you, think, you know, uh, life is gonna end at that point when uh, you lose your first yeah. girlfriend. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. God, think about we've all there. Uh, yeah, I was like, oh my god, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna, yeah, I'll never live. Yeah, no. uh, that part of the maturing process. Um, so in in these novels, do you have uh, uh, the antagonists and protagonists, and then the the passive protagonists and antagonists, or or uh, like you do in other novels? Uh, which one specifically? Like, uh, which genre are you talking about? I mean, like, um, um, uh, do you have the, the, okay? Uh, Look, a story I'm writing right now. Um, uh, so alternate military history story, and um, these is wrapped around. It's 
uh, the name of his Richmond grad is uh, about a climactic battle um, in, in Richmond, um, the final battle of the Civil War. And it's wrapped around a, it's about the novel, a 14 year old boy, 14 year old Southern boy, who they call the boy sniper. And he represents really the um, Southern male at 14, it coming from the, I think it was the William Faulkner poem. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah, but anyways, he said, uh, I am, yeah. Okay, well, where he says every, um, and he's talking about the Battle of Gettysburg, and he says every four, every every fourteen year old Southern boy at two o'clock they look up there and say. But anyway, he, he represents the, the Southern every the, the Southern kid, and then you have the guy from um, the general on the northern side, and everybody hates him. And they want to kill him. So, I guess that's what I'm getting at. I mean, you have somebody in the character that everybody loves, and everybody just despises. Well, you have those in almost every novel. But I, I believe at least in almost every novel, or almost every novel I've read in terms of romance, uh, be it Regency, historical, jazz romance, uh, normal, erotic, whatever. There's always some sort of antagonist or passive antagonist or protagonist and passive protagonist. There's either the protagonist being the antagonist themselves, by going into their head and saying, you know, all these bad things or some psychological thing going on with them, or there's going to be some sort of boy getting in the way. There's going to be some sort of lover getting in the way. There's always, always some type of character you can almost call an antagonist, or you can fully out call them the antagonist. There's no in between. Um, and I know we touched on this the other night, um, but some people don't know. Um, do you consider yourself like when I start writing something, I have no idea how it's going to start, how it's going to end, or anything like that? An impulse writer, or are you an impulse writer, or do you already know what's going to happen? I, in your story? I am, I'm an absolute impulse writer. I do not plan, I can't plan for the love of my life. I can't plan hotels, I can't plan vacations. I'm the sort of person who will do anything on, I want to do this now. And I will do it. I'll just do it. Okay, uh, I like that. that. Uh, I mean, I, that, that's uh, that. That's me. I've, uh, I, mean, I have planned. You know, hey, I'm going to Florida next week. But I, I've been the type to the, hey, let's go. And you know, the next thing I know, I'm thinking I'm there going, man, what was I thinking? Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I kind of, um, I, I could never sit there and plan it out because it wouldn't, it wouldn't go how I wanted it to go. Um, like I said, because when somebody asked me that, and I told them, I said, I have no idea. The hardest thing for me is to get the first sentence out. And then once I get the first sentence out, I can go. When Do you ever find um, uh, yourself, um, uh, when you're writing, that you're having to, it feels like you're forcing it, and it doesn't feel, feel natural? Uh, actually, that's going to go into a... Uh... Thing. I, never, I never really told these on any interviews ever before. Um, a couple years back, 2014, 2013, I stopped writing for at least three to four years uh, entirely. I couldn't, I couldn't write whatsoever. Um, there was something that happened to me uh, a few years back, private mostly, and when that happened, I had gotten a trauma where my hands would start to shake every day. I would cry at the keyboard. I would, I would entirely collapse at the keyboard. I still have these things to this day forward, but not as badly anymore. Um, th there are days when I will look at the keyboard and I will just absolutely collapse like that, just not able to do anything, not able to speak, not, not able to breathe, and you know, having panic attacks. But I do have those moments where I simply cannot write. I have to force it, and then when I force it, it's bad for me because the, the more you force something, it's, it's just going to end up shit. You can't. It doesn't feel natural, and it feels... The reader can feel that it's forced because you're not putting any passion or love into it. I can relate totally with that because, I mean, there's times that... I can, uh... And it just is, I'm like, I'm, 
and you know when you're forcing it. It, it just does not feel right at all. And and, and I think, um, especially you who does, who's a professional writer, I mean, you're probably, I mean, I know I'm my own worst critic at it, so I, I know that you would probably, you're probably just on yourself all the time, like wanting to be, wanting it to, wanting it to be good. I mean, I mean, I I judge myself every day. <laughs> when it comes to writing, I am the utmost worst critic of all of all time. I will I will never ever accept compliments on my writing ever. That is something that I have learned I am unable to do. <laughs> I am never able to take compliments well. And I cannot seem to be positive about my writing no matter what I do. I will look at it and I will say this is shit, I'm going to replace this. This is shit, I'm going to replace this. And I'm going to go in this cycle for months. I... Um, why, why can you not take compliments? When, like, when I post something, it's, I, I, it's, I, I cringe and I hold my breath. It's not that I want compliments. It's just that why, I mean, like I say, you're doing it for, I, I do it for I want the people to be entertained. As long as they enjoy it, then I'm fine. And I'm just like cringing, just holding my breath. Like, God, did they enjoy that? Is it okay? It's not that I really want the compliment. I just don't want to let them down. Does, this, does that make sense? I mean, uh, yeah, it does. Uh, I'm not the same. I I don't enjoy pleasing people. Actually, I do write for people, uh, mostly for myself, but also for people. But I'm not the type of person who will accept my own writing if I know it can be done better. If I know well, this sorry, no. be done better, I will think of it as shit until I have perfected it. I'm a perfectionist. Well, okay, that's good. Um, um, you said you was not writing for people. Who were you writing for? Honestly, nowadays myself. Uh, now mostly myself. Uh, as of late, as of these last two years. Before that, I wrote only because not writing would drive me to suicide. That was... The single only reason I ever continued writing was that. It would drive me to suicide if I didn't. Um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, have you ever, because I've did this before, and like I said, this, this is just what I'm doing now. It's a, it's a Facebook. It's a, it's, I started off as a Facebook post. I, I used to have notebooks just everywhere of stuff. And I had to do it a while. I wanted to specialize in that. And it just started off as a Facebook post. These people like, like, really loved it. And, you know, here I was a year later. Uh, and then, but I mean, I've, I've posted stuff. And when I was talking about not feeling natural, and I'm like, just holding my breath. And I'm like, this was so bad. This is awful. And then and everybody's like, oh my God, that was so great. How did you come up with that? I mean, have you ever had that experience where you think something's just I awful? Have. I mean, I have after I went public. Um, I stopped working for a publishing company as a contractor. Uh, I worked as an as a contractor under NDA to write erotic stories for money because it paid the bills monthly. And then once I stopped it and I went public about three years back, I decided, hey, I want to do self-publishing. I have no one. I have no, no company behind me. I have no editor. I have no one else. I, I just want to do this because I want to write what I want to write. And I decided to share those things on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, and a lot. And people began liking it. It, it began getting traction. Like, I, I began posting small excerpts, and they just like, hey, I, I really like this. I love this. I, this is great. Da, da, da. I'm like, so shit. Is that how, is that how it got started? Is doing that? Because, I mean, that's when I, I don't know. I think I told you that the other night about getting it manuscript. Like I said, it was just a Facebook post. And then I followed up with the second and third, and then I've just got to write all these compliments, and then I started writing. So, I, you know, because I, I, that's the reason I said I hear people about self publishing, and I didn't really know what they was talking about. Is that how it goes? It's just put stuff on Instagram and somebody finding it? and or Well, for me, no. For me, no. I worked for a publishing company for a couple of years first. Right. Um, that, that was the first thing I did, um, the private contracting. So for me, my career started a couple of years back in 2000 and I'm not sure, 2015 or 17, somewhere along there when I was in college. 
because uh, I was doing contracting while college. And after I quit that, my public career, um, instead of the private one, because I left the private one, and then I decided, I, hey, I want to go public. My public career started three years ago in 2019, or mid-2019. I decided to post stuff on Instagram because a friend told me, hey, you should post this stuff on Instagram. You should start becoming your own brand. You should. Uh, you don't know where you want to go now after you quit working for a company. You're free to do whatever. You're free to write whatever. So why not make your own brand? And I followed that advice. You know, I, I went with it. I said, okay, fine. I started posting on Instagram, first and foremost. Then on Facebook, I started sharing short stories on Facebook, which gained like five, six hundred followers in a week, less than a week. Um, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, would you um, post the entire story at once, or was you posting like you know, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three? Or how, how did you do that? I posted very, very small excerpts of a prior novelletta that I wrote. A small short story novella that was shit. Uh, I first published it without any, you know, proper editing. Blah blah blah. That was what gave traction first, and then I began marketing my newestly launched book, Atlas Loved, on I believe a year and five or six months ago, give or take. Don't don't quote me on this. This was a year and some months ago. I began. Posting stuff about that novel by showing the cover and small, very small excerpts, like let's say a small paragraph of a chapter, chapter two or chapter three, a small little paragraph. And people began loving those paragraphs. They're like, oh, hey, I love this. This is good. This is nice. This is da da da. And that's what began getting more traction. I went from 100 and said- followers to 2,000 in less than a week. When you say that, um, when you're talking about followers, do you have a private page, like a Facebook page that, that you put these on, or do you have just a whole account that you do it? Or I have what, what, two public accounts, one on Facebook and one on Instagram, and another one on Goodreads. Goodreads, Goodreads search, of course. Uh, what exactly is Goodreads? Is that, that a Goodreads page side? Is- the one side everyone trusts to read the reviews of a book and to have quotes of a book on. So if you really like the book, you're probably going to re- leave a review on Goodreads instead of Amazon. Amazon is good because it makes the book come come across to more people. And it makes it, you know, the, the book looks trustworthy. But on Goodreads, it shows you how many people have read it, how many people have liked it, They will post excerpts of the book. They will post quotes of the book. They will leave reviews like this book is good or I like this book because da 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 da. There's even authors who use it. There's famous author Stephen King himself uses it too. Um, It's one of the most trusted review sites in terms of books. What would you say, like, because I was, I thought about this a while back, um, because I I, I joined them. these author groups and you know writing groups and i was uh, joined them this this to uh um want myself to get better so i could you know ho- hopefully i became a better writer and i could be more interesting and then i joined them and it's like well what do you think i should name this character and what do you think i should do that it seems a, <laughs> a waste of time and so what i thought about doing then was i thought well man what if i um formed a group for people who just like writing and people to read their stories and um, is there groups like that out there where people just write their stories and people follow it i mean for people who are like i said are just having or just it's just a hobby to them who's not trying to go out there and well like which which you said you know flood the market i mean because what i've seen in these aspiring authors i've got you know thirty thousand people in there and 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 it's this is like I, guess what i'm saying and I'm, I'm not trying to put any of these people down they may be great but I, it's just not somebody who I think would probably be good to saturate the market, as you said the other night. I mean, I I agree with you. I don't like the market being oversaturated. It already is oversaturated enough. By mm-hmm. uh, as of late, there's the uh, pro female movement, where it's 
always a female lead and there's more and more female writers now and there's um then there's male writers male writers i believe will become less and less as of now because i don't think there's going to be a lot of great male novelists anymore not in the modern market at least not not current market because well, there, there, there's 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 that'd be a good idea for one I don't know. It's become a very oversaturated female market. No, no, because... no, no, no. Well, I mean, do, do you think that would be because I'm I, that that would be a good Facebook group to start for for these people who yeah. is just before they go write their own stories, they're trying to oversaturate everything else. Hey, just come write your story here because nobody's going to buy it, and you're just wasting everybody's time. Because I, I, you know, I mean, there's, there's thousands of these groups on Facebook. I'm in some of them too, because I just wanted to test some grounds out to see where I can gain traction or not. And I see a lot of bundling authors or bundling artists, not authors really, just bundling artists who are writing short stories or poems or whatever. And I believe it's good that we have these groups. Because it makes sure the market isn't oversaturated by even more skill, less skilled people mm -hmm. than it already is. At least those people stay there in those groups and write and whatever. And then you have the real authors who actually do the work every night and every day to make sure they get published and that they get their book out there and more, you know. So yeah, it's instead of somebody who is just a hobby to and plays around and then tries, yeah. yeah, I see what you're saying. I mean, because like this thing right here, I don't even know how many words are in it. And but you know it's like something that I might write a post on it in two weeks and, and may not touch it again for you know or as in a real author the ones that I've talked to they sit there and go six seven eight hours sometimes and and not stop writing and then I uh, I must just say I have my partner who tells me like uh, honey you need to sleep there you you haven't slept eaten or drank anything for the last twenty hours or thirty even um. I will often go into the zone and I will go out from eight hours to 30 hours plus and I will not notice. I will sit there for 30 hours straight, back pain and all, and I will not notice that I have not eaten, slept, drank, or even moved in the slightest until I press enter on the last paragraph that I'm wanting to write that one day. Until that moment, I will not notice anything. You know, I've not, I have had something like that before. I mean, like I said, I'm not trying to stem or put myself nowhere in any kind of author stuff. But where I went and I was turned around, I was like, God, I've been doing this for nine hours. And I didn't really realize how far I'd gone. But I was also having fun with it, too, instead of feeling, you know, like it was something I had to do. Um, I don't know if that's part of being a real author, how I mean, real authors do. There's there's no rule to being an author. There, there never was, never will be. You um, can write whatever the hell you want, however you want. What about these things like, because the well, thing I was talking to you, when I was talking to you the other night and asking you questions, um, and, you know, and I'll read this stuff and, and stuff I was taught in school, and I'll read other authors say this right here, like, you know, you never start something with ing or you never start a sentence with adverb and said you never use adverb when you don't have to and i'm reading all these different guys saying these different things i'm like yeah who am i supposed to believe here uh what would you tell a young author that i mean i mean if i would have to tell a young author something it's don't write do do, do not write for the love of god do not write <laughs> well, I, 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 it's like not even not as a joke, both as a joke and not. For the love of God, if you are young, do not sit down and write. That is the most horrible pain you will ever endure. If you truly want to give an experience to the reader, you will sit there and you will feel every single thing that you wrote, every feeling and emotion, every sensation, every memory that you write will be you and only you feeling all of it. Because it is necessary to feel everything to make sure that the reader feels it too. And I took that for granted so many years ago. So, so many years ago, I took that for granted. I thought, hey, this is normal. This is probably normal. This is 
okay to, you know, sit here and feel horrible every day until I learned that it is normal, but it's also part of the process. It's something you have to accept about yourself is you're going to have to feel these things. You're going to have to feel everything. No. And one thing that um, when I first started, uh, I did, uh, it was, um, I lost my train of thought there. Um, character development. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, do you oh, find no. it hard developing a character? Uh, because I've had ones where I've, it, mm. it was so easy, you know, so easy. And, and I can explain this character. So and then I've got one that's like, just things like just a dummy over here in a mannequin in a mall. How, how do you go about developing a character? Uh, uh, I could use an example, actually. When I was writing John Holloway, of uh, my book Atlas Loved in the 1940s, 1960s, or not, 1960s and 1980s, I believe. I forgot the years I put him into. John Holloway started out as a sentence from a prompt, or not a prompt, a quote I saw on Pinterest uh, about Atlas, the mad god, Atlas loving someone madly, bearing the world on his shoulders, yada yada. And then I started that off with that quote and he became that kind of sort of rough very rough american guy very i hate my life i hate what i've done i hate everything i regret everything blah 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 I hope. go back to where you was at when you said 1940 because i had a phone call in it put you on hold and i just got to right there and i don't know why i did that okay um mm, well what was the question again uh, it was, uh, let's see, I gotta get you back on camera, because I can't see you right now. Um, it was, um, uh, my camera not showing you. Um, yes, let me get back in here. And yes, well, now it's just me. Where are you at? Is your camera on? Uh, I have my camera. Yep. All right, just what do you want to have? Take your time. Uh, let's see here. Anyway. Um, I'm not finding you. Can you see me? I see that. Yeah, I see your entire phone. <laughs> there we go. Okay, now we're back. Okay. Character development, you were talking about um, um, somebody uh, in the 40s, right? Yeah, 1940 to 1960, somewhere, give or take that yeah. area. And uh, by the way, you're sharing your screen, just so you know. So, yeah, oh, that's it's fine. Cause I, nah, cause I, I don't know what I did, but I had to get. Um, um, can you, what, what are you, are you saying me or what can you? It's showing your entire phone screen. The okay. Facebook message and everything. How is that? <laughs> that's, not, that's not what I wanted to do, is be showing my Facebook messages. All right, let's see. Let me go here and stop. You click stop sharing screen on Skype. Yeah, let me go back up under here. Uh, uh, let's go back over here. Uh, you see that um, button on top? Click stop sharing screen in blue. Yes, but uh, I'll leave it in here. Stop uh, uh, sharing screen, stop sharing screen. Oh, uh, bada, 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 bada. there we go. Is it going? Yep. Okay. All right. Sorry. I'm. Go ahead. Okay. So, oh, hold on. There we go. So, character development. Um, I started John Holloway in terms of my novel, in his in Atlas Loved, um, as a sort of rough hewn guy, uh, without knowing, actually, ever. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it would become that sort of American uh, 
American patient in, in a sanatorium. And I thought he was going to be a very gentle, very, very loving person. Yeah. But he developed on his own. And I think for me, character development has been very natural because it just comes along with the uh, the story development. So what happens in the story sort of says what the person is becoming or who the person is. So that that's how I develop my characters. Like <laughs> he, he started having sessions with his doctor, being sarcastic, being... Um, okay, I think I'm um, cause, okay, all right, that, that sounds really good, because that, that, I think that'll help me more, um, because that kind of got me to thinking of one of the, um, favorites in this thing that I was doing, uh, anyway, make a long story short, uh, it was a, it was a battle scene, and a lot of the commanding officers were killed, and ended up being a lower officer, and, uh, command strength, command, uh, command structure in the is different, uh, in the list of sergeant majors, the highest up major is kind of like a mid-ranking officer. And there was a scene where uh, this battle happens and um, this major goes, who's in charge here? And the, sar- and the sergeant major goes, you are, sir. Now, what the hell are we supposed to do? And from there, he developed into this cranky old sergeant major that was just rough. And then everybody fell in love with the guy. So thanks for sharing that, because I think that will help me. Um, because I, I've had problems with that, you know, how, how do you develop a character? If you ever had a character that you developed and then you figured out it was based on somebody you knew? Yes, actually, yes. Yeah. Uh, how long did it take you to realize that you were writing that character, that was the character you were writing about? I believe it took me two days after I was half into the novel. Uh, like After I was in half of the novel already, half the story was written out, I realized two days later that, hey, this is, uh, this is based off of someone I actually know. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> and I told them, like, hey, uh, I, I think this character is you. And I had them read the character and like, you are scary. You have depicted me from point A to point B. Fully, completely, and perfectly. <laughs> that is so awesome because I've had a few of those things when I used to do this. When I was like, "Oh my god, that's that's my friend. That's my friend there." Um, um mm. the uh, in the fiction or the love fiction books. How many of um, the characters? Um, yeah, is there a percentage that they get killed off, or the ending is where they die, or they all move off happily into the sunset and live the rest of their lives out in the kingdom? And you know, there's a very high percentage of where main characters or love love interests die. Um, pretty normal nowadays, anyway. And then there's the very high percentage where people also end up in happy relationships, but it's. It's sort of like a go-in-between market. Sometimes people want very dark stories during specific months, and then sometimes when it's summer, they want those, you know, very light stories, very quick to read, very gentle, very uh, fresh, uh, like a fresh bit of bread of air. You, you want to sit out there on the beach, and you'll read some loving story that's fun and enjoyable and full of sarcastic remarks and jokes and, you know, a lot. Or coming-of-age novels or travel novels, all, all those sort of things. So it, it depends on the time of year. Um, deaths, I mean, I know it probably varies. I mean, is it, do you have the ones where people are just taken out instantly, or it's a struggle, or at the end, or um, somebody's murdered, or uh, just ends again, or? I notice a lot of novels like to torture or make slow deaths happen over time. You think so they can say goodbye or they can make them feel the loss of a loved one? I, I think it's more like a build-up so that the climax feels heart-wrenching. It's like 
you get attached to the character and you start building up the slow pace of the death scene that's gonna about to come and then it happens then it really happens and they say goodbye or they're leaving one last moment or they're self-sacrificing or whatever else that is it's a whole build-up always a build-up actually it's, it's the same as i did for uh couple of my own works too what about if they had one i mean just kind of thought of me about got this book and you're 300 pages into it and everything's going and they're just sitting there and then bam the girl shot or something or he shot and the book ends there it was just kind of just ends like this when the sopranos cut out you ever seen anything like that i have yeah a couple of novels like that um there's also the Hemingway's novel too, which the main character just dies, and that's it. Like literally, that that's the end of on end of the book. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like this, yeah, like like you know, they're walking down there, like God, this is just going to be such a bam, and or they're just dead, and then that's just how it stops. Yep. That, I mean, that's, to me, I'm sorry, that, that just seems like an awesome. It, that seems like that would either be people would either just be pissed off and hate that, or it seems like God, that would be so awesome. You know, how, how are those books received? I was reading a few novels as of late, and then there's one novel that I was reading, and I I was looking forward to something good happening at the end, because it was building up to be this very happy, super great ending, and then just moments later at the last page, it's like, the end. The main character just died. That that's it. I was like looking for more pages, like where, where's the rest of the story? Where's where's the happy ending? Where, where's everything? <laughs> no, that's it. That's the end. That's it. You're not getting any more. Main characters is dead. <laughs> I'm sitting here like, oh fuck you, author. I was hoping for something. Right? Have you ever um, uh, killed a character off and regretted it and brought him back? Twice. <laughs> I I didn't plan to. One time I did. Um, I was upset on one day, and I just decided, you know what, this story deserves to be a proper fucking ending with a sad, heart-wrenching twist, and I'm like, okay, you're gonna die. That's it. This is the end of the novel. A day later, I woke up and went, hmm, you know what, this novel could do better with the main character still alive. Let's bring him back. Because the reason I asked that, that was kind of like what I did with the, um, that was what I said about the Sergeant Major. I had him in there, and I thought, oh, that's pretty good. So I just, you know, I loved him, though. He's a character, so I killed him off. And then I killed him, and, and everybody loved him, and I killed and, and it was like, it wasn't the same without him. And then I was like, I've got to, how do I bring him back? And <laughs> and, I, and I was like, you know, the guy got shot in the back of the head. How do I, <laughs> how do I bring him back? And, and then somehow, I forgot even what I called. Uh, um, well, how did I, I forgot how I titled the as far as like um i don't know if, I, if the chapter was titled, titled the resurrection or one returns from the dead but uh <laughs> when i brought him back anyway the, the major who i was telling you about here he here's a voice talking to him he looks up into the silhouette he could see him looking down and it takes a minute to figure out and then, anyway the way i explained it was uh yeah he got shot in the back of the head but i took up he was on a flesh wound that knocked him out. They thought he was dead and took him away. And, you know, everybody loved it and brought it back. But I, that's what I was like, you know, how, how do I bring this guy back? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, everybody said, uh, but it worked out because, I mean, like I said, he was everybody's favorite character besides him and the 14 year old kid. Um, so, how many books have you actually written? Or, well, let me rephrase that. How many uh, stories, uh, novels, short let's stories? Let's see. Publicly, it would be one. Privately, for another company, it would be six or seven. I've lost count. And short story-wise, I've written at least two books that I have yet to publish, short story-wise, and one poetry book that I've yet to publish. So oh. eight novels, give or take, so to speak. Some of them yeah. for a company in some and the this one that I recently published as of late. Do you have different writing styles? I think I do. I have noticed that some people have told me specifically like in some projects I will write differently and in other projects I will have my own true writing style which is 
more or less the elegant writing style that's sort of like Fitzgerald, F. Scott Fitzgerald. That's my true writing style. It's uh, that sort of gentle wine tasting style where you just you read and you feel this is nice, this is elegance, this is pretty good, tasteful, nice, and it, it feels like a 1970s or 1960s America in a jazzy style. And then I have that very rough style where I will write rough characters and I will follow that very rough American style, like um, John Steinbeck type of style. The uh, rough American, so to speak. Who, um, who is your favorite author? That would be either F. Scott Fitzgerald or Hemingway, for two specific reasons. Fitzgerald, because he was a very romantic and elegant writer, who I, to this day forward, adore, and will always revere as one of my greatest inspirations. Or Hemingway, because of his... I suppose you could call it every true sentence that he has ever written. Because every sentence he writes is... It's like juice. You get addicted. Sentence one, you're hooked. That's it. You're not dropping that book. Um, I want to go back to something that I want to come back to this right here. I'll go. I was talking to you. Um, well, I was, I was, uh, we got mixed up there when I was some of those authors. Uh, what do you say to these people who, who say uh, you can't start a sentence off with uh, L Y or I N G? Or you can't start off with a conjunction. Or you can't start off with a, um, uh, a or D or yeah, the adverbs or whatever. Um, I would say write whatever you want. Honestly, there's no rule to writing. There never was. There never <laughs> will be. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what I'm it's it's like, I, it seems like uh, that's what I wonder. Because uh, when I read these things, then it seems it comes off as a. You know, you can't you know you can't use that word. It's like, well, wait a second. When did y'all? When did this become a rule as far as authors go? Um, you know, mean, when I say, don't ever use the word was, and I'm like, you can't ever, <laughs> can't ever say was. Why? why? <laughs> yeah. Truth be told, every writer is a big fucking narcissist. I myself am one. You probably are one too. Every writer in this world, <laughs> one big egocentric narcissist. Yes, yeah, sure, you're no lying around it. Yeah, okay. I, I think you've got a good point there. <laughs> um, yeah, because uh, I mean, I've had, you know, and I'll tell you just a, a funny st a story. Um, <laughs> uh, this one group I was, that I was in, the, one of the members, um, the guy just absolutely hates me, which, I, you know, I, I, I don't really care one way or another, but like anything we're talking, any subject matter we're on, Discussing if, if I said if I told you the sky was blue, he'd call me a liar and say it's green. And like, <laughs> so he comes across like three of these things that I'd written, and he goes, "Man, this is really good. Who wrote this?" And I was like, "Oh, that's like that's just it's me. It's something I wrote." It's like here's the start of it. So I gave him the first link of the thing, and he just starts in just cutting me this right and just just criticizing everything. I was like, "What? Well, I go, you loved it, man. You found out I wrote." It. So I've seen that a lot among people. Um, uh, uh, I don't know what their problem is, but I, I found that was that, that was very humorous. I mean, I don't share my pub my work publicly anywhere besides uh, a few beta readers and an editor. That's it. Or uh, besides my partner, she and a few other people are the only people I allowed to see my writing. Uh, Otherwise, never, ever. I don't ever share them. But I know that a lot of people will be having that superiority complex because they're an experienced author or experienced this or that. And they will say, hey, I write in this way, therefore you must write in that way. So you must well, start with this in that way. And that's. And this, this is Scott Rare, though. He wasn't even a writer. He was just. He told me because. Um, he wasn't even a writer, uh, and, and you know, and, and if a writer was criticizing it, that's fine. You know, I, I'm I'm okay with the critique, uh, but he wasn't even a writer. Um, it was just the fact that I wrote it because then he starts going, 
the storyline so unbelievable and this right here and blah, blah, blah. And I said, look, man, it's alternate history. I don't really think you have to have a um, believable storyline for alternate history. And I said, and I can tell you it's a lot more believable than Guns of the South. I don't know if you ever heard of that book or not, but um, this guy who has made a fortune of alternate history, uh, Harry Turtledove wrote a book called Guns of the South, and it's supposedly where uh, these people go back in time and buy AK-47s and bring them back to the Confederate Army, <laughs> and they end up with... <laughs> okay, now... now Jesus Christ. My, story, my story of a uh, climactic you know, battle of Berlin, Stalingrad battle, is a lot more believable than a time machine of that, so you know, that's what I told him. Um, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so he just did that. Um, is there any other, I mean, with writers or with authors, um, like, like yourself, um, I've, I've noticed that most of them have just one thing that they stay with. Is that common or do you see them? Yeah, you, off? Once you find out your true writing style, you find out what your brand is and what your niche is. Okay. I found out mine is, um, elegant jazz romance jazz age stories classics and so i stuck to that and then there's people who write uh, sci-fi there's people who write adventure yeah. uh, thrillers spy novels you name it you know and because yeah. like you know like we were thinking about like, you know we were talking about that and you know i think about you know the john grishams and um stephen king and you know just those that because I was thinking the other day, somebody it said something to me, um, and that the reason I asked you that because it's quick because when he said, I told you about the guy, the guy was having a manuscript. He said you you have a knack for writing um, war. I, and I don't know if it'd be alternate history history just with you know war, but he said you have a, a knack for writing about combat. He said the way you describe it and you're very descriptive in it. So I thought. Well, maybe that's what I should always do, but with my hobby is just stay with that instead of writing something and looking totally foolish doing it. I mean, I advise every author and reader to try every field, first and foremost. Um, well, see, like, I would never to... know how to write, write, like, I would never know how to write a fiction. I mean, how to write a love story. I would not know I mean, how to mean, That's what I'm it. saying. Like, try every field, not because it's not your field, but because it'll give you experience. It'll give you understanding of how different things function, and it'll help you become a better writer in of itself by trying new areas and seeing what can I take from this. Even Should if it be know. something that you find interesting, something that that that, that, that she liked, because you know, or or, or you know, or, or I'm trying to think the way I want that, uh, something that that, that you, you're passionate about. Um, like um, I thought about the, writing, writing a story of um, a campaign, like for president or for governor or something, because I have a desire of deep burning passion for politics. I thought, hey, that would be fun. You know, I could sit there and develop all these candidates in this campaign and blah blah blah. So, so is, is it something that you should be passionate about when you're writing, or just pick any subject and go? You know, when you're writing, you should be passionate about it either way, because non-passionate yeah. writing ends up shit. One way or another, it just, it just ends up shit. There's no good writing that is good when it's not passionate. But if you're just trying out new fields, it doesn't have to be passionate. All you're doing is trying out new fields to learn. That's it. You want to take away something from every genre and make it your own. Proper stealing, but in style. You know, you do this in media, you do this in writing, you do this in dancing, music, whatever. You style, you steal in style. Boom. And you make it your own. But if you're not um, trying new fields, I would say write passionately about what you are passionate about. That will end up being your biggest goal and biggest driving force every single day of your life. What, what do you, do you are passionate about? What do you do when you have a sentence and you know how a sentence should go? Yeah. But you can't make it. But you can't word it right. I mean, this word should go here. Or this, no, this word needs to go here. Or, or no, I need to change the structure. I mean, do you ever have that problem where you, you know how the, what the sentence is? You know, how it I should sound? 
you read it, yeah, does I it sometimes I sometimes do, and that's why I have editors uh, at my disposal. It's like if I ha- if I if I find some sentences badly written, I'm gonna leave them there, probably, and I know my editors will fix them because yeah, they I don't will know. see that. And if it's, bad, it's badly written, but you just can't find the perfect way to, to express it. Express it, yeah. I have these problems at times. I um, give you an example. Um, Atlas Lodge was finished in less than five weeks. Literally, that that book was finished in less than five weeks. Almost a half, almost a full book, actually. How many words? And I left that book be for five or eight months, give or take. Don't don't quote me on that. I left that book be for months after I almost finished it because I couldn't I couldn't find ways to express what I wanted to express. I was burned out and I could not for the love of God find any form of way or manner to express what I truly wanted to express in those sentences. So if I stop at a sentence and I can't express it, I'll either take a break or I'll think, why can't I express it? What what am I trying to express that is so hard? Because there's always some reason. It's either your emotions, um, some trauma, some memory, something to do with the characters, something to do with your daily life, what you're feeling, you know, these things. It, it, there's some reason that you can't. And you always need to take that perspective and just sit away from what you're writing and sit there like, why can't I express this? I need to figure out why. After you do, then it's easier. A lot easier. What do you do when you have writer's block? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I didn't write for three years after that trauma that happened to me. So uh, that, that took a lot of um, pushing and uh, convincing, healing, and much more just to get me out of that. And to start me writing again. But when I had writer's block as of late, when I stopped being uh, able to write on Atlas Loved, I I almost went on a five five month vacation. I I didn't write for five months. Just stopped entirely. Left it be. And then five months later, I came back to it and reread the last, I believe, four sentences. And from there on out, I just began writing what felt natural. Like, I got a feeling after those four sentences, like, ah, okay, let's go, boom, that's it. So, I advise taking it a break, um, big one, if you need one, short one, whichever, get a new perspective, drink some alcohol, have some sex, uh, go on a vacation, go party, whatever it is you like to do, go do it. Whatever activity, whatever physical, mental, emotional, whatever it may be, go do it. Come back later, and you'll find yourself able to write again. If you ever sit there and wrote a chapter or or, or just wrote something and sit there and go, man, that was so good, it flowed so good, and then look at it and be like, oh my god, that's awful. <laughs> I have... Uh, I wrote that this love in five months, so yeah, no, five weeks, and so you know, I wrote like five chapters in less than two weeks, give or take. Then I thought to myself, you know, all these five chapters are great, and then I came six chapter and seven chapter, and I'm looking at it, I'm, this is fucking awful. <laughs> this is fucking disastrous, awful. I I hate it. I deleted the entire fucking chapter later. What um I hear these people in some of these groups, these people um are probably if they're watched they'll probably get this at me, but I don't hear. Uh, they say I, I I don't comment a lot, but I say I'm, somebody will post something and uh, I, get, I don't know if it's to make their build their self up, make their self feel better or, or something, but uh now these people ask a question like, um, hey, is this enough words for a book or for and there's like well, maybe for a day or maybe for a week? And I'm thinking, you know, why don't you just answer the question and, and um, 
help these people out. But uh, are, are these people in there, you find them almost like they're hating on other people. And I don't get that. Um, I mean, have you noticed that in these groups? The people the, who... The, the, the people, it's not... Like, to say. People, well, people are always, instead of like, when it's, well, I've seen these things, you know, helping each other, instead of helping each other, these people are trying to put the other person down. Like, why aren't you know, this person just asking a question? Why are you trying to, you know, down them? I don't, I don't understand why are these people, yeah, are they big? That's, are they... that's so common in almost every group online nowadays. That's super, super common. That's like every group I see on Facebook, on Instagram, YouTube, even with specific YouTuber groups and uh, writers groups, artists groups, painters, even musicians, there's always someone trying to put you down. Mm. There's no other reason than it just they want to. They have nothing going on in their life or they have some emotional trauma ongoing in their life to the point that they only can express it by saying I hate what you're doing. I don't like what you're doing because you're doing something that I want to do or you're doing something that makes me feel, that makes me react. Or I want to change this. I want to do it in my own way. And they're not going to do it, so they're going to complain about it, you know? Yeah, because I feel I've seen that in one of the days, this young lady, and she, and now, and you can tell me the difference in something in the number of words but you know they just all started just jumping on her because they didn't write enough words or whatever to express her and i was like you know it's just if she's happy with it you know who, who really cares um uh and i don't know if this is make these people feel better about themselves or uh pick them up but i just think it's really tacky uh how many words is it from a or explain the difference short story, book, novel. Is there so many words that can especially go into each one? Or do they classify uh, as that? Short story can be 5,000 words, give okay. or take. That's, that's, that's a short story. That's a couple pages. That's it. That's all, that's all it is. Novel is between 50,000 to 70,000. Uh -huh. And then it's, it depends on the genre you're writing. In sci-fi or adventure or like fantasy, you're going to want 100,000 or 120,000, 150,000, 200,000 at times even. The romance novels can be 50 to 70,000 or 80,000. And, you know, it, it depends on the genre, really. But, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, there's a difference between the short story and a novel. Short story is usually just a few pages one or two pages mostly really and a novel is a whole book okay so what about when you say one or two pages um and i don't know why this can be this um I'm trying to think of a short story. Uh, something that has 60 or seven i don't know why i'm thinking of this right here but i remember when um the movie brought back mountain came out and they said it was based on a book like a 42 or 52 pages or mm -hmm. is, is that a short story is that a book 52 pages is a short no, story. I think, I think it was 82. Okay. Because well, well, when you said... Well, 82 I was, 50 pages, that's a short story. That's that's okay. entirely a short story. Because I was confused there when you said one or two. I was thinking, like, one or two. And I, I like, see what you yeah, mean. Originally, originally, most short stories are very short. One or two pages. But okay. there are other short stories that are, like, 100 pages, 200 pages. Most. No, not even 200 pages. 100 pages at most. That's okay. a short story. 200 oh. to 300, that's a book. All right, so like um, when I was a kid, I used to like, and I don't know if you've ever heard of them, uh, I loved the Louis Lamar Westerns. And he would have some that would be 120 or 130 pages and some 350 or 400. Um, 150, is that a short story? Is that going to be a book? 150 can be a book, but it depends. You have, you do have some stories that are like 150 180 pages that there are titled the book but i would see them categorized as a short story really unless it's 250 pages it's a book like like a book is at least 250 pages anything below that is a short story um and what and i remember what i was going to add on to that while ago because there was a guy who um in one of the groups i was right and 
<laughs> and I, 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 it shouldn't be me that he said this about because I don't want to be anybody's inspiration on this. But he said that I was his inspiration to start writing. I was like, oh man, but I'm not, a, I'm not a writer. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just having fun with this. It's, uh, I'm not what I, I do not consider myself an author, but he kept writing. He's been writing the story now for a long time, and um, he kept asking me to critique it, critique it, critique it. And I said, I'm not somebody that should be critiquing it. You know, I'm not that type of person. And he wouldn't leave me alone. And I just finally said, I think you need to do this. If I do this, if I do this, because I didn't want to hurt his feelings or anything, because I just thought it was boring. I didn't like it. Um, so I, I mean, I, I don't know how. Um, somebody should go about asking somebody to critique it and how if you're critiquing something should you just be totally honest with them um, if you're critiquing something you should be 100% honest they want real critique they want real honesty they want you to tell them honestly how do you feel about this is it boring? okay just say it doesn't matter because he, he, he when he kept on, and I, when I finally said, I told him, I said, look, I said, I, 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 I think it's boring. It's hard for me to follow along. Uh, characters, I don't see anything out of them. And to me, it's just, um, it's just something I'm not interested in personally. And he got mad, never asked me to critique it again. And that's what, what I am with. I'd rather somebody not ask me to critique it because... I don't want to tell you if I don't like it. If I ask somebody to critique it, I want them to be brutally honest with me. Um, that's yeah, all, cause that's, I don't, that's that's all you need. Brutal honesty. That's I, when when I was telling you that um, people kept telling me, "Go, hey, go get this done." It was you know manuscript, and I said, "Well, okay." I said, "Let me show it to Dr. Kelly," and and then I was just sitting there just. You know, hold my breath, and I was just expecting him to get to get shredded. And he goes, "Yeah, you know, I told you about the problems I have." But he said, um, "Well, other than these errors, he said this is actually not, not bad. He said, it's actually very interesting." And I was like, "Oh my god, I can't believe Dr. Kelly said that." And I was, you know, ecstatic on cloud nine then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I was brushing myself. You know, just for him to say, you know, he, "Don't ever bring this kind of stuff to me before." Or again, but um, yeah, so that made me feel good about it. Um, like I said, it's just something that I'm, I'm playing around with. Um, so how old was you when you started writing? You said you went through without it um, as a kid and got older. Uh, I found out I was born with a writing talent when I was eight years old, I would have to say, because that's when I started writing academically, and that's when right. I began feeling that sense of insanity from not writing because I began writing and then I I began seeing oh shit this is doing something to me this is uh this is affecting me <laughs> I'm being affected by writing <laughs> out of all the things in this world writing and um so you do have this thing was, I've got to go do it I've got to I've got to, I've got to go write something I've got to go yeah okay. like that okay. that's what in a habit it was like I got to write something now right now um after that, I got mentored by the author um, Jules Harper oh, for a couple of years course. until 2014, before the trauma happened. And then afterwards, I began writing officially for a, a private uh, erotica company. And after that, I began my career, so to speak. Um, okay. I was asked, and I was um, I was asked, you know, I, I was in I mean in, a, in a one group, and I was asked to write. These two researchers asked me would I consider writing. Or write, I guess get your ghostwriter there. Is that what it's called? Anyway, yeah. these two researchers in Kennedy assassination asked me would I write a book for them, and I got to thinking. Um, you know, I think I've ever done is non is nonfiction, um, and I started thinking about you know in college I wrote the papers and I said yeah I thought yeah I guess I could probably do that, but then I started thinking how would I do it? Do you think you could turn around and go from writing um, these romance novels to writing 
a non-fiction book? Will it be difficult? Will it be? It would be extremely difficult. I am not a non-fiction writer. Absolutely not. Because I, then that's what I'm like. Because I'm looking at it like you know, um, I, I tried to sit there and think it through because I'm thinking about you know when I was taking history classes, or political science classes in college. There I am. I'm writing out you know the story of how this happened, but here. I've got to figure out how to make this interesting and how hold this. How am I going to tell the story and hold hold their attention when, you know, in this right here? So I don't know if that is. I think some people just have to be blessed with with the ability to hold somebody's story in in nonfiction. Um, would you agree with that? No. Yeah, I absolutely would. That's. I find most nonfiction books to be the most boring read I have ever done in my entire life. Any scientific s- document, etc. No, I love science. Don't get me wrong. As much as I love technology, but I hate reading it. I absolutely hate reading it. Cannot stand it. So, whenever I see someone who can hold the attention of the reader in nonfiction, biggest applause from me. Absolutely, biggest applause from me. That is the biggest achievement in that field ever when it comes to writing nonfiction, holding someone's attention constantly. Biggest fucking applause to that person. Because that was what I was worried about because, you know, I sat back there and I thought, you know, you're writing a paper and then telling a story. And then I tried to imagine putting myself in there and telling the story of that. And I was like, I just I don't think that, you know, because within in fiction, I, or excuse me, nonfiction. You know, to me, it's like a history book. You know, <laughs> um, like you got had in school. You know, some people are gonna just facts and numbers and stuff. So I agree with you on that. Um, what my favorite author um, was um, Stephen Ambrose. Well, one of my favorite authors. And but and he wrote about. I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but it was World War Two, and he was one of those guys. And it was like whenever I picked up one of his books. To when he told the stories of Norman of, the, of, of you know the Western Front World War II, I, I couldn't put it down. Um, he, he was awesome for that. Um, uh, yeah, he's, he's probably the best. Um, when you said the two, I thought it was something funny. funny. Um, I hate um, alternate history, <laughs> but yeah, that's the only thing I've read about, it, and I hate it. <laughs> like I would never watch an alternate history uh, TV. I would never read an alternate history book or story. And now you're writing it, and that's uh, that's the thing I do now. Yeah, that's the, that's the and I've, I've got four of them, and I hate it. I mean, I because I I would never watch them. Too. Well, I'll take that back. Um, you know, I did kind of like um, oh god, uh, uh, of course I was a Cold War kid, uh, Red Dawn. <laughs> so, yeah, you gotta love that. Um, yeah. Do you like the short stories better or novels? Both, actually. Um... I got a lot of short stories that I bought, as well as novels. So it depends on what I'm in the mood for. Like on a light summer day, I'll take a short story with me just to read it, enjoy it with a whiskey or you know, a, a nice alcoholic type of thing. And you, then you're a Hemingway type. I mean, are you the you the you're the drunk writer? <laughs> I'm I'm the drunk writer. Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Uh, okay, you know, I've, I've, of course, I've heard of those. Um, uh, my one of my favorite writers, um, and I don't know what you would call that, but um, uh, have you ever heard of Hunter S. Thompson? Oh God, Thompson is my God. He is an absolutely astounding man. If I got to meet him, if I ever had gotten to meet him <laughs> before he died, I I would have drank with that man every day. Believe me, you that that man is an amazing man. I just wanted—I mean, it didn't even have to be about talking about. I just wanted to hang out with a dude. <laughs> I mean, I, did you ever read his daily routine? Yeah, I did. I mean, that oh was God, like, I would have joined him. That was like it was. It was like uh, rise six oh five, Dunhills hills and coffee, or orange juice, uh, cocaine, <laughs> cigarettes, yeah. and more dope, well, new well, more well, papers, barrels, Motorbiking. It, well, it was that. It was like starting at six, and it was like you know, you got this, and you know, more cocaine, and you know, more co- house, and more cocaine. And you go to this uh, restaurant, and it was like, 
and he started drinking too. It was Chevis. And this restaurant was like a two cheeseburgers, taco salad, order of onion rings, huge meal. And then, uh, uh, three jiggers of Chevis over ice on the way home, more cocaine, grass to take the edge off, drop acid, and midnight, uh, Hunter is ready to write. <laughs> it's like, it's, like this guy, I was like, how did, you, how did you sleep doing cocaine 20 hours a day? Uh, but yeah, he was, he was amazing. And, but he was somebody, though, that um, when we were talking about that, um, uh, how I had one genre, that guy could write anything. I mean, he was writing for ESPN right before he died. I mean, Fear and Love the Young Gumbo. Gumbo writer, I mean. I mean, uh, uh, his, uh, the, I guess my favorite one was probably um, uh, Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail when he was writing about Richard Nixon in 1972 because he hated Nixon. Yeah, that, uh, that reminds me, Johnny Depp was the first man to get to read uh, the novel and Fear and Loathing and a few others um, because he knew Hunter Thompson closely during his uh, younger years. And uh, I remember during an interview with Johnny, uh, I saw that uh, he said Hunter S. Thompson told Johnny Depp to read his novel in specific ways, including the tonation, the speed, the um, feelings, emotions, everything. Like he told him step by step exactly how he wanted his novel to be re read. That is one of the luckiest men I know. Johnny yeah, Depp I got I'm to sorry. know Hunter S. Thompson closely. I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> I don't know of course, I think, other great, I, think all the, I think all the great ones are mentally off. <laughs> Just yeah. Say, yeah, yeah. A little bit. I mean, Hunter S. Thompson was, was nuts. I mean, like the day he killed himself, he's there just got thrown the wife and they thought it was a you know, just, He one day woke up and said, you know, I, I did everything I wanted. Bye. That's it. Yeah, I think he, and I think he had, he'd either just hung up the phone with his wife or he killed yeah, her when he was on the he, phone. But he, he had an argument with his wife and said to and said to her to go out of the bedroom, which he had never done before in his entire life. I he, he was, was on the phone with somebody, man. or he just got off the phone with somebody. I thought his kids was in the next room, and he was on the phone his with her. His kids was in the next room, yes. And he told his wife to get out of the bedroom. He then called her on the phone and said, "You can come okay, back." Okay, okay. I'm sorry. And. During the time he said she can come back, he just took his life. Like that. It, it, it wasn't even depression. He just had his life. Be good. There were, well, there was something, I think, to that, though, too. He, I remembered him saying something about he hated the month of February. There was no football on. Because that, that was his favorite month, and it was dreary. And I can't remember if this was something I know he wrote or about, but he said... Um, um, you uh, relax. This won't hurt a bit. You got 17 more years than you wanted. Act your old damn age, or I can't remember if that, if that was a note he'd read out or something. But I, 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 I mean, I remember reading several times about it. They killed himself, but yeah, just kind of like, you know, that's it. Yep, that's it. And the line. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then what? And Hemingway was what? He was only 61 when he killed himself, or yeah, he he went insane because of his injuries. Um. He had endured a lot of injuries, so eventually they caught up with him, and he couldn't write anymore due to his uh, bad memory and many other things that happened to him. So not being able to write and that being the only thing he had in life, he just grabbed a shotgun and killed himself. That's it. He, he wouldn't bear life without writing. He wouldn't bear life without being himself. Whereas Thompson just one day woke up and said, I've lived life. That's it. Goodbye. <laughs> that just shows you the the eccentric I can't say the word. Uh, uh, he, stops. It's, he was a fucking eccentric man. Yes, that's the that's trying to bring it out. I mean, it, I, I, <laughs> like he wasn't even depressed. The dude just woke up and said he didn't want to die. He want to live anymore. Yeah. That's it. Happily too. <laughs> how how yeah. do you? How do you just wake up one day with a smile on your face and say, that's it. I'm done with life now. I'm, done. Uh, I'm happy. I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 that just goes to show, I mean, 
the how his mind worked. He kind of reminds me of <laughs> he reminds me of Larry David <laughs> in a way. Right. Um, <laughs> he, I mean, he really reminds me of him in a, in a way. I mean, this is uh, he, he was amazing. I, I love reading stories about him. Who've been running and everything. Um, uh, everything about him was just uh, I can't. Uh, I don't know. There's words on the screen. Um, what do you think about? Writers like because they used, they forced us to read them in the middle class. Edgar Allan Poe. Did you like him? No. Okay. Um, Shakespeare and Edgar Allan Poe. No. Uh, I know I should. I know they're literally giants, and I know that they're loved by almost everyone, but I hate them. Um, and I'll tell you, I didn't like Poe either. And I'll tell you, what, I don't know what the hell he was talking about. I know what he was talking about. But to me, his prose is just so heavy-handed. I, I but can't I, I stand. Can, I could be like the Raven. I can tell what the hell he was talking about. It's all about his fantasies and dreams. Really. All of his poems and all his short stories are all about his fantasies and dreams. That's it. That's all they have ever been. About. We had to read so much in one of the literary classes I took, and I was reading any of this stuff. It was so boring to me. And, they, and there was one story, and you'll probably know what I'm talking about. I can't remember the name of it was, but it was like uh, he was in the room with a dead body, and the body would come to life, and this right here. And anyway, the, the professor ended up telling me it was because he was having um, erectile dysfunction. <laughs> and that's what it was about. And I was like, that's it? I mean, that's what we're about? Um, is it true you said that about Shakespeare? Is it true all of his stories were comedies? Uh, a lot of them are tragedies too, actually. Um, a, a lot of them are love stories and tragedies because he. There's studies about Shakespeare that where he did have a family. But I've heard they were all comedies to him in his mind, the way his the way his mind worked. These these tragedies. No, a lot of them were tragedies too, and um, during his last years, he did return to his family and. I believe that's where he wrote his last few tragedies and comedies, and then that's it. Nobody knows where he was buried. Nobody knows uh, where he went after that. Because he returned to his families in his last year. Then, during his last few years, he wrote his last few plays and then disappeared. That's it. Nobody knows where he got buried at all. What is the? Um, oh, I lost my train of thought there. I was fixing that. Um, uh, it's, uh, well, Emily Dickinson. Uh, her writing style was it? Wasn't it about a jilted lover when she was younger? Yeah, she was. Okay. That's what I thought. Um, and you said earlier, because that's what I want to go back on to, that it's going to become, you believe it's going to become more and more of a female dominated market just in the um, love Last story? Years. Or, or, uh, in the, um, in, in, terms in, the of, in terms of like fantasy and romance, it's mostly female dominated now. Like, uh, Do you think it's going to go into other genres? I hope not, personally. Because I love still reading some male stories where it's written properly with the male perspective. Because some women, I understand women want to write males, those sexy, steamy, hot males. But I still want the original train of thought between the female and male. And females are great at writing out females too, don't get me wrong, as well as males. But it well, doesn't feel as natural thoughts. when a man writes out a man, you know. Yeah, um, like, <laughs> uh, before I get mad, they'll get mad at me if I say this, but I was joking. You know, I, I was joking with my friends um, in 2016, and um, I was one of the first person that people that told, even before it got started, 2015, when he announced it, I said, I said Trump's going to win this thing. And it was like, oh, you're crazy, Trump, I said, it's going to win. And then after, you know, last day of the election, everyone's over with, even going up to him, I said, he's going to be her. And, and, um, and this is my friend said it was Vegas. How did you know that? And I said, I said he's running against a woman. A woman can't be president of the United States. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Good God, I, above. 
<laughs> and, and of course, everybody just busted out laughing. I was like, what are you doing? Well, she's not, this, well, I can't be president. And my friend, yeah. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I know what you're going with that too, because I, I can put that in the other, other aspects of life. There's just certain things that a man the male's perspective on, like um, sports. <laughs> I hate to get into that, but. But I, I definitely see where you're, where you're going with that. Um, uh, you said you had another book that was planned to be released soon, or? Uh, yes, I have. I have This is Lost, another um, title in 1940, set during post-war. And then I have a poetry book titled The Night that is yet to come out. And then I have a fantasy series called The, Fal the Fallen's Fantasy Series. Oh, I All do remember it now. Oh, I'm sorry, Fisher. I do run out of question that I had for you because when you first um you know you was telling me about this and I was like these years and you you totally threw me off with these years on like, what you know why did you pick these certain time periods these certain you know forty to nineteen forty to nineteen eighty or nineteen you know, uh, I mean, I'm I'm a jazz writer I love elegance and the I explain what a jazz this, writer is like, I I love sophistication. I love elegance. That's, I love. Uh, that's a jazz. That's what that's describing a jazz riser, elegance and sophistication. Yeah, like, like yeah. those years where there was still some sort of respect between people, where there was some still of elegance to the language, where you spoke uh, softly, you spoke gently. Build that, that wall. Build that wall. Yeah, you basically. <laughs> you hear what you were saying? Yes. <laughs> okay. I don't know if I got the joke out of you. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. I, I, I see that. Um, um, more of a um, uh, kind of you know, sound. Um, yeah. And, and like, um, you know, 1920s, 1930s, 1920s, those are the years. People partied, people went out, had fun, had sex, drank. Dance, play music. They had contraband alcohol. Traveled the world. They they did amazing things, amazing feats. And that was the age, the golden age of jazz. And that continued on until like 1960, even after the war. And then after 1960, it just all went downfall after the modernizing. Uh, you know, the phone, the cars, the uh, in. <sighs> the um, suits all of that you know yeah that's 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 an interesting take that how things have changed since the modernization because i was actually doing something the other night uh, of something i was fixing a, a part of this channel um that I, it's just gonna be me talking i, I uh, she, in the south uh, we're huge college football fans and I'm going to start doing this thing called Saturday Down South, where I go back and talk about a certain football team and their season. One of them I was thinking of the other day I'm going to do was Auburn Tigers 83, and I got to thinking about how I was going to start off, you know, back think back when VCRs and microwaves and Walkmans and <laughs> those things were not archaic relics now, because you look back and you're like, that, oh, that's cute. You know? It's just uh, it, that, that – I guess we'll get that modernization has changed everybody in their way of thought and that's uh in the way things even are the wild like even the wild west had a very elegant language even then like most of the can learn late latin too yeah, yeah and they could say like women would greet you with hello darling or hello lovely you know men would also say hello gentlemen or they would greet respectfully they would always have some form of respectful vocabulary that was expanded upon a lot and then you give them modernization <laughs> yeah and maybe it's because we're behind but you know in, in south it's still that way uh, you used to say yes ma'am and no ma'am yes sir no sir yeah for people um gentlemen how are you this evening we greet people uh you know we shake hands um uh we're we're polite people, but we can be robbed of <laughs> robbed of really easy to. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and I don't know why that's, uh, but it's, that's something that, that the South has held on to that a lot of other people, a lot of the regions I've noticed have lost. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to get you off your. No, no, um, no. It's, it's okay. Just got me thinking about that. Um, um, I believe it's time we round off soon, actually, because. Uh, well, I was just to ask you if you had anything else you wanted to say. I didn't realize that we'd already been. Uh, I told you I looked forward to this interview. Um, most of the times I'm looking at the clock and trying to figure out how long it go, and then I didn't realize we'd been doing this for almost two hours. <laughs> that uh, uh, two whole hours. I really enjoyed uh, this. I mean, I really enjoyed it. Um, this is my second interview in the public as of late. Um, I hope for more over time. Um, I'm, you know, I'm just a normal, ordinary jazz writer. I write jazz romance and erotica and general romance. Uh, I have my published book, Atlas Loved, on Amazon, which you can find on Amazon.com, Amazon.co.uk, or any Amazon site for that matter, or on Kindle, uh, Google, Google Books, I believe. Uh, I set it up two days ago, and yeah. did you already tell the names of your books or the names? Do you already tell, tell the names so people will uh, know? Atlas Loved by WM. Um, um, not to be confused with Atlas Shrugged by another author, Atlas Loved. <laughs> well, Wolf, I don't know how you got that name, but I like it. Um, it has <laughs> been a uh, pleasure having you on. I've really enjoyed this. And it's been a pleasure you. having you too. Um, Good luck with your books, and I uh, hope they do well for you, man. Yeah, and uh, I believe in five or ten years, let's redo this again and see uh, the success. <laughs> we should, and for all your friends out there, come subscribe to the channel, because we'll be there. And, uh, yes. Thanks, man. It's been uh, talking to you. Subscribe okay. to The Sea Show, yeah. hosted the by... The Sea Show. The Sea Show, hosted by Chris. I will um, actually... Uh, I, what I'll do is, um, after I get it edited... I will uh, send you a link of it, um, and you can post it on your Instagram. Uh, give me a day or so because um, my phones have messed up, and I'll make sure I get it to you, and you can post it on there, man. And take your time; it's in no rush. I only updated my followers that there's enough. There's a uh, interview coming, but that's it. <laughs> Didn't say when. We got one coming huh? very soon. Yep, Thank basically. And I'll cut that four percent battery. <laughs> I, did, I did not realize that it went um, um, it went that long when I looked up there and I said, "Oh my God, man, this guy's been talking."